As you see, my subject is What Factors Influence Public Health Messages on Alcohol. The original title was What Factors Determine Public Health Messages on Alcohol. And when I reflected on this, I thought, well, actually, they don't. They just influence it. And that will become apparent from what I'm going to say, I hope. Um, there before you is uh, some of the uh, levels of individual consumption of alcohol considered to be safe in various countries uh, around the world. They're the uh, levels which are thought not to, in to increase significantly any uh, risk of negative health or social effects. These are figures for men. The uh, figures for women are very similar, as you might expect, although lower. Uh, I can't promise that all these figures are bang up to date, uh, but that, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter the point I'm making. The point I'm making, there's quite a lot of variation, up to a factor of about two, which is quite a lot, really. Um, there's the figure for some other countries. Even within countries, there's some variation. Um, in Spain, it's clearly better to live in the Basque country or Catalonia rather than the rest of Spain, where drinking alcohol is clearly a lot more riskier. Um, and when you look at weekly levels, a similar sort of variation uh, exists, and various advice linked to them. Now, my question is, why is this variation present at all? I mean, uh, wouldn't you have thought that since the science is surely the same worldwide, uh, the only factors influencing the recommended levels would be, well, you know, the facts. Well, uh, if you dig a little deeper into this, and certainly if you've ever been involved in the process of setting such recommendations yourself, all, so all sorts of other factors come to play a part quite legitimately. And at the end of the day, it's quite surprising that the figures are as consistent as they are. And the reason for the variation, are, there are several. First of all, as we've, as we've heard, um, I'm sure, all through this meeting, there's a lack of consistency across the studies when it comes to specifying the exact quantities which uh, may, may be safe or lead to misuse. Uh, this is not at all surprising. Uh, all sorts of the, the, the factors which lead to the data in these studies, they come from different countries, populations are different, different sorts of men and women. It's not surprising that they, they don't, lead us to a precise recommendation. And then, of course, you've got within that person-to-person -person variation as well. Um, a second, I think, very, very important factor is you have to take into account the variation in drinking cultures uh, around the world. Um, this is because the purpose of any public health recommendation is to change behavior so you, they have to take into consideration what behavior is considered to be normal in the population you're aiming at. And of course, around the world, what's considered to be normal in terms of alcohol consumption varies enormously. It's worth pointing out that in uh, countries with a Mediterranean-style diet, consumption patterns, including wine with daily meals, they tend to have higher uh, recommended maximum levels in, in those countries than those countries with a culture of uh, binge drinking on beer and spirits, for example. There's also the, the perceived nature of the problem, which will be different from country to country. Um, according to WHO, I have some figures here. They say of the 2 billion people who consume alcohol worldwide, 76.3 million, 3.8%, have alcohol-related problems due to misuse and 1.8 million are estimated to die from alcohol-related harms. So in this context, it's not surprising that the positive consequences of moderate consumption might appear to be much less relevant. And it's not really surprising that they're not taken into account uh, widely in the government recommendations. It seems to me that a person who is misusing alcohol presents a problem to be solved to society, and, and that will take resources. A person who is not getting ill because of their lifestyle is invisible uh, and is not taking up any, any resource to be dealt with and therefore not a problem. Even though if you costed out the net benefit uh, to society from moderate consumption of alcohol to the net harm done by misuse, when you do those sums, it may well be that the, uh, the, the benefit, the cost benefit due to uh, moderate consumption outweighs the the cost of harm. There's one German study, I think, which shows that. 
Um, you've also got to consider that the purpose of a message to be, is to be effective and uh, to the population you're, 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 you're targeting. And I was chatting to some Australian colleagues once who were involved in uh, health promotion, I think in Northern Territories, dealing with problems of major misuse up there. And they said to me, what, what's the recommended level in the UK? And I said, well, it's sort of three to four drinks a day. And they said, what? If we told that to our, to our people, they'd laugh in our face. We're trying to get them down to single figures. <coughs> Um, the other factor is that the, uh, the public health benefits of moderate consumption seem to be much more likely to be taken into account when giving, a, when giving advice on the diet as a whole than on if just addressing misuse. And one good example of that is the uh, Mediterranean diet pyramid, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, where uh, daily wine consumption is uh, features. Um, some of these recommendations, as I've said, focus on misuse. Others focus on giving dietary recommendations uh, as a whole. And there are some tensions there between those two approaches. Advice to abstain on some days might be perfectly sensible if you're addressing a population minimizing misuse. It might not be so sensible if you're trying to maximize the health benefit. Uh, different advice for different age groups might be entirely appropriate when addressing health benefit, but maybe not appropriate when addressing misuse. Um, the pattern of consumption, the beneficial patterns of consumption, which um, seem to be almost as important as uh, net amount consumed, as Arthur made that point about last night, um, that might be lost if you're making a, a message aimed at misuse. And any policy that seeks to reduce consumption overall across the board may well reduce moderate consumption as well and may not be the most appropriate thing to do, might not be the most popular outcome. Going back to the previous slide, there's one more factor which I'd like to mention to you on recommendations given by governments, because often this requires the need for approval by politicians. And uh, any civil servant will tell you that when that, you've got to go through that hoop, a whole set of different considerations suddenly come to the fore. Um, what do the various interest groups think, think? What does the opposition think? Is it consistent with my party's overall policy? And probably most important of all, will it make me popular? So looking at all these factors, it may be is not so surprising that the figures vary uh, by a factor of two or more. Perhaps it's surprising they don't vary as much as that. Um, it's, a, it's also true that when considering dietary advice across the board to a population, moderate alcohol consumption is not often featured. They tend to ignore it. And there are a number of reasons for this. This is just my own, uh, my own speculation. There might be fear of encouraging abuse if they did so. Uh, they might not be aware of the science. Um, nutritionists uh, may, not, may well not be aware of uh, the science of alcohol and health, which comes in a sort of different category, a different sort of box in, uh, in, in science overall. But I do think that the, the strength of the evidence and the strength of the beneficial effect, which has, been, which has been apparent from the literature over a period of 20 years now, and is not getting any smaller, will make ignoring the beneficial effects, more difficult to defend as time goes on. Now, what I'd like to do now is illustrate some of, the, some of these factors, uh, how they come to play, by telling you a story. And the story is how uh, public health recommendations in the United Kingdom have evolved over the last 20 years or so. Um, in the early uh, 1980s, we had some advice um, in the UK that people could, should, men could, shouldn't consume 28 units a week for men, call that drinks. 28 drinks a week for men and 21 drinks a week for women. And a drink is 8 grams of alcohol. Uh, like many things, uh, things are bigger and better in the USA and alcohol uh, levels are no exception. I, think, I believe your, yours is 12. 
in the United Kingdom it's eight. So the advice then was 28 units uh, a week, uh, 28 drinks a week for men, 21 drinks a week for women. And then in 1987, a joint committee was set up, uh, the Royal College of, uh, it's all mixed up there, Royal College of Physicians, Royal College of Psychiatrists, and the Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, and they came up in 1987 with a change. And they recommended no more than 21 units a week, drinks a week for men, 14 drinks a week for women. Uh, and that became the standard health advice of the time, although it was never very clear what, or clear at all what the rationale for that was. But that was the, uh, that was the position. And then around that time in the early 1990s, there came emerging more and more evidence of a protective effect of alcohol on coronary heart disease. And so um, the Department of Health at the time decided to address this in a review on sensible drinking um, in 1994. But before I go there, I'd like to mention Samuel Black to you because the evidence of uh, the beneficial effect of alcohol on heart disease is not something which just arose in the 1980s and 90s. Um, I'm, I'm indebted to my colleague, uh, Professor Alan Evans, for this. He's Professor of Public Health and Epidemiology at uh, Queen's University in Belfast. And in his presentations, he loves to place things in historical context. And he, he, uh, he mentioned Samuel Black, but I'd like to mention to you now, because it's so uh, fascinating. Uh, Samuel Black was a physician in Northern Ireland. He worked in Newry. His dates are there, 1762 to 1832. And one of his contributions to medical science was the characterization of angina pectoris. And he carried out his, sort of, his own sort of epidemiological study based on his own experience and what he'd read. And in this publication, in his book, Clinical and Pathological Reports, 1818, he drew up a list of the factors which he thought made people prone to angina pectoris and those not prone. And those prone were men, the stressed, those who ate well, an accumulation of fat around the heart, and those who did not exercise. The not prone were women, foot soldiers, but not officers, the poor, and the French. <laughs> um, so the Department of Health Review, 1994-1995, um, that was the terms of reference. They decided, this is, this is different to the review took place in 87, which was done by the medical profession. This is Department of Health decided to review the evidence and its interpretation for the long-term effects of drinking alcohol and to consider whether the sensible drinking message should be reviewed. And the review group comprised officials from various government departments of, with an interest. There was health, of course, agriculture, uh, the treasury, um, there was the... Uh, Department of Home Affairs, representatives from Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And at the time, um, I was head of nutrition in the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, human nutrition, not sort of you know, cows and pigs and things. And uh, so I found myself on this group. And like uh, all good scientists, I thought, well, you know, what does the evidence show? So um, I got myself uh, a member of... Uh, the Royal College of Medicine, so I could use their library. And I spent a good, quite a few, a long time, a few months looking at the literature and reading about the effects of alcohol on health and uh, uh, the epidemiology of it and various aspects of it. And I thought I was coming to the view. And I, I, mean, I, I thought, well, there's a strong protective effect here. I mean, I, I just, over, I've just been overseeing the year before, or been involved in a review of um, the effect of diet as a whole on heart disease, you know, cholesterol and saturated fat and so forth. And I was looking at this evidence for alcohol, and I thought, this is really striking, it's really important. I mean, all the, the evidence seems reasonably consistent, the effect is large, and it, there also seems to be some plausible hypotheses about why uh, we get these effects. We're getting perilously close to real science here. So um, I, I then went around the United Kingdom talking to medical experts in the field, and I couldn't find anybody who really knew about this work. And then one day, I had a phone call from a colleague, and he said, are you going to the 
symposium in Ljubljana next week. And I said, why would I want to go to Ljubljana? He said, there's a, there's a symposium on wine and health there. I said, well, he said, maybe you should go. I thought, well, maybe I should. So I got myself out to Ljubljana. And uh, I sat at the back of this lecture theater in, in Ljubljana. And there, paraded before me during the day, were all the authors of the papers I've been reading for the past six months. And I went up to each of them and said, I'd like to come and see you. And in December, I did. And I came over to the States. I met Kurt Ellison uh, and Eric Rim at Harvard. I went over to uh, San Diego to see Michael Creakey. I went up to Oakland to see Arthur Klatsky. And when I got back to the UK, I met Serge Renaud when he was visiting Richard Dull in Oxford the next month. And it was that experience which uh, gave me the, the confidence to realize we were on the right sort of track. Um, so during 1995, the committee was formulating its general approach, which was this. Alcohol can inflict serious harm. Taking the wrong quantities, too much, you know, you know the story. Uh, liver, liver disease, uh, all, all sorts of other high, high blood pressure and all the rest of it. It, it can make consumers lose control, they get drunk, they get involved in accidents. But if consumed sensibly, little or no harm is likely to be caused. There seems to be some evidence of a beneficial effect. So the question was, what is the appropriate level of intake that be regarded as sensible? So that's the position in sort of early 1995. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the, in the medical profession, there was clearly some stirrings going on. Uh, and they were, I, I don't know what they were saying, maybe what, what's this group of civil servants doing looking at the alcohol message? That's our job, you know, they're, they're civil servants. What do they know about it? Um, so what they did, they formed a committee. Again, the, of the, uh, the committee of the, the joint uh, colleges, as I mentioned before, psychiatrists, physicians, general practitioner, practitioners, and they came to the conclusion they, they consider whether their guideline of 21 and 14 units drinks a week should be changed in the light of evidence that alcohol is protective for CHD. They reported in June 1995, so it was quite quick, and they concluded that the guidance should, should be unchanged. And the rationale for that I'll come back later. Uh, now, the end of uh, 1995, and the, where the committee, the committee, the Department of Health Committee, concluded the basis of the advice should be this. Don't get drunk. Don't drink and drive. Don't drink and swim, physical sport. Don't drink and use machinery. Don't drink when you're up a ladder in the workplace. Things like that. Um, guidelines should be daily and not weekly. Uh, the, old, uh, the, the guideline of uh, 21 drinks a week um, had no uh, daily input. It was quite possible to use all the units up, as it were, on just two days. If, uh, and still be within the, within the message. Uh, and we came to the conclusion that regular assumption of three to four drinks a day for men, two to three for women, uh, at these eight gram units, unlikely to accrue significant health risks. That was the phrasing used. We couldn't see what harm could, significant harm could come there. Uh, consistent consumption of four units a day, three for women, was not advised. So we're giving people a range. Um, as far as the health benefit is concerned, the maximum health benefit for men over 40 and postmenopausal women, those people in society who are most prone to coronary disease, uh, could be achieved by drinking one to two drinks a day, light drinking. Uh, and also said that such people may wish to consider the possibility that light drinking might benefit their health. Um, and that report was published in December 95, and I have it here. And there's a, should be a very attractive photograph of it. There it is. Um, now, when it came to publication, uh, which was in December 1995, um, there was a quote from the chairman of the Joint Working Party of the um, Royal Colleges, which reported in June 95, if you recall, uh, 
and he said this, because the medical profession opposed it. Uh, there are two basic reasons why there should have been no change. The best medical evidence we have suggests that there is no, there is no health benefit beyond one drink a day. Well, that seems to me quite a good reason for a change. Then he said, also our drinking is affected by those around us. So if more individuals drink, that will encourage drinking to, drinking to rise in the population at large. Now this is a very interesting point. And uh, this theme runs through their report because it, it forms, I think, the basis of a lot of, uh, or some thinking in the public health arena. And if you look at the report, it's it put this way, their report in June 95, if the mean increases, this is mean consumption, the proportion of people drinking in high risk categories is likely to increase with consequent increased risk of associated harm. Now this is based on the observation that the, the distribution of drinkers within any population is sort of Gaussian distribution like that. And the mean is of course in, in the middle of the peak of the apex of the curve and that's the mean. But if you look at the curves which uh, are in populations which drink more alcohol anyway with, with greater means, what happens is you get the distribution and there's a longer tail of people misusing alcohol. And if the average increases more, you get an even longer tail. And the idea behind this is to, you, uh, you must deal with the population which are people who are drinking too much by dragging the mean down. So you give advice to the general population for a low mean, and that will, in some logic which I don't quite follow, mean that people who are misusing alcohol at the far end will be, that their number be minimised. Put in simple terms, it means people who drink moderately have to reduce their consumption to help people with problems under an arch somewhere. And it, it seems to me a sort of policy which belongs in the Soviet Union in the 1950s, this sort of centralist control of uh, trying to get people to fit into a preconceived idea of distribution. Anyway, the report came out. Um, you can see the sort of headlines which uh, it uh, elicited in the press. That's right. Fury of Abuza's Charter. And the Secretary of State, Stephen Doral at the time at the press conference says, I don't have a Abuza's Charter, I have a report on sensible drinking. So anyway, it was published. Uh, the UK became the first government in the world to recommend that certain sectors of the population drink to maximise their health benefit. That was a key uh, part of the report, of course. Subsequently, what's happened to it since? This is 1995, we're now in 2009. Um, after a period of time, the public health message was handed to the Portman Group, which was a, an industry group uh, set up to promote the moderate consumption of alcohol, the whole of the message. And the, gradually, the message of public health benefit began to disappear um, on the basis of no further evidence, no more reviews. Uh, th th this still remains the, more, the most recent review of the evidence in, in, in government. Um, and I, I sort of keep a, an ear out for what, what's happening to this. And I was listening to um, a really excellent Radio 4 program last year called Case Notes. It's all about various aspects of, of medical health and the population presented by uh, a general practitioner. And this program was on liver disease. And uh, in the program, the presenter asked this expert, a professor on liver disease, says, well, what, what, are the what are the government guidelines? And he said, uh, well, the government guidelines are um, uh, 14, 14 drinks a, a week for women and 21 for men. And uh, I thought it was rather odd. So I emailed the program and said, are you sure about this? Well, you know, didn't they get rid of those in 1995? And the email came back and said, uh, no, you are mistaken, and referred me to a website. And so I went to this website, and it wasn't an official website at all. It was a website uh, of a group dealing with alcohol misuse problems in the part of the United Kingdom. And um, the website actually, it's very interesting, the website actually said, uh, there has been some confusion since the Department of Health issued new, more complex guidelines on sensible drinking in December 1995. Much of the confusion arose from misleading press reports about those guidelines. The position is the weekly limits of 21 and 14 remain the same. In addition, 
There are new daily guidelines, four and three, uh, in addition to this. Um, and that was actually repeated. It, it, they, it's completely wrong. I mean, they just made it up. But, um, and that was repeated in a, a report on alcohol misuse published by the British Medical Association in February 2008. Uh, coming back to um, uh, the uh, 80, 80, sorry, 95 report and, and the early 87 report on the use of this population effect to um, influence the sensible drinking recommendations. I actually thought that was the basis of it for many years until a couple of years ago there's a report of um, one of the members on the original committee in 1987 um, which originally set the 14 and 21 uh, limits and this is uh, by Dr. Richard Smith who's quite a prominent member of the medical establishment in Britain he's former editor of the British Medical Journal and he says this um, he remembers rather vividly what happened when the discussion came round to whether the group should recommend safe limits for men and women. Uh, the epidemiologist on the group, this is 1987, his line was, we don't really have any decent data whatsoever, and it's impossible to say what are safe, what's safe and what isn't. And other people said, well, that's not much use, is it? If somebody comes to you and says, what can I safely drink? You can't say, well, we've no evidence, come back in 20 years and we'll let you know. So the feeling was we ought to come up with something. So those limits were really plucked out of the air. They weren't really based on any firm evidence at all. It was a sort of intelligent guess by the committee. Somebody not on message there. So in the light of all that, what can we, what can we learn from this? And these are purely um, personal reflections. Uh, on, on what we might take home. Um, first of all, it, it doesn't make sense to be absolutely precise about this. The evidence doesn't, simply doesn't justify it. Give people ranges and explain that the evidence is not precise and explain that there's a lot of person-to-person -person variation and they've got to take into, that into account. Engage all interest groups in, 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 and work towards a consensus obviously involve all parts of the medical profession. That said, there are two observations, my personal observations about the medical profession which um, uh, I'd like you to respond to. First of all, specialists tend to think that their specialists are the most important. I do, I know that. And secondly, doctors are more influenced by, more by those who walk further with consulting room root doors by than, by the, by the, than by those who don't. Um, be very clear about the rationale for any recommendation. Get away from this sort of uh, manipulation of populations. Treat people as adults. Uh, tell it to them straight and make the messages relevant to them as individuals. And uh, finally, um, on what's happened to the message on beneficial consumption in the United Kingdom, uh, my view is that it's a pity. And uh, I think the public is uh, being deprived of, uh, to use the language of Mr. Gore, an inconvenient truth. Thank you very much.